The biggest issue I would point to, and, and this is going to distinguish me from, um, from Mr. Troiano, the current policy of the magistrate court allows one judge of that court to authorize prosecution of a defendant and then for an associate judge who is a lawyer to then take money from that person for private representation and to defend that individual. It would be, of course, in a different court, but it's the same defendant. And so my rule would be that, that no associate judge, and certainly not myself, will be permitted to take money from an accused who came through that court uh, for personal, you know, for personal gain. Uh, it just won't happen. Uh, when I'm Chief Magistrate. My name is Jason Hasty. I am an attorney in the Augusta, Georgia area. I am running for Columbia County Chief Magistrate Judge. I practiced in front of the Georgia Supreme Court, the Georgia Court of Appeals, and many of the state superior and magistrate courts in the state of Georgia for the past 22 years. I want to be judge in the Magistrate Court of Columbia County to make some positive changes. We have in Columbia County at this current time a policy which in the magistrate court allows uh, judges to accept money for personal gain from defendants. Uh, it's not prohibited. Uh, there's no policy strictly prohibiting it, and so this is happening. And what we need to understand is that in Columbia County and in all of Georgia this year, if you want to vote for a judge, if you want to make a difference, uh, you've got to vote in July, not in November. This year the election will be in July. So we need someone who is both uh, all people, who will be fair, uh, who will do justice, who will apply the law, but also understand the compassionate uh, side. Uh, we need to put people back to work. Uh, we need to have uh, try to boost the economy. Even, even judges can consider work factors. They don't really create jobs, but judges can take into account the fact that someone is either employed or has a potential for a job. I've worked as an attorney for 22 years, and one of the things that I have learned by appearing in front of, of other judges is that if someone has a job or at least has the potential to be employed, education is so important. Um, one of the reasons I want to be judge is to make a difference. Uh, as a public defender, I worked for seven years as a public defender, and when you call a school or you call a group and you indicate that you would like to speak to that school, to the students, to the young people, many times they don't want just a lawyer, uh, and sometimes they don't want a public defender. Uh, they want someone who has attained a position of judge, for example. And so it will open many doors, I think, for me. It will allow me to set some good examples, and it will allow me to show the people, everyone, regardless of their background, that you can come from a small town, for example, in Louisiana. I, was born and raised in Menden, Louisiana. I uh, came to Georgia in 1986, graduated from the University of Georgia School of Law. Uh, my parents uh, put my education and my well-being ahead of theirs. And even though magistrate judge may not seem like a, a big judge, it may not seem like a really great position, and it certainly doesn't pay a lot of money, it's still important. Mm -hmm. And it's still something that uh, I hope a lot of young people will aspire. A couple of years ago, uh, I was in Macon, Georgia, for the Republican convention, and I had the honor of hearing uh, Governor Nathan Deal speak at a breakfast. And one of the things that Governor Deal said is that Georgia has an extremely high percentage of its population locked up. Now, we all believe in being tough on crime, as they say, and especially uh, repeat offenders. And I have some ideas about repeat uh, offenders. But for those who can work, for those that we have an, an alternative to incarceration, uh, if they have the potential to work and be part of the workforce, we have a high unemployment rate among teenagers, among young people. And so if we can lock up the most serious offenders, and if we can have some programs, we need some changes in our repeat offender laws, especially violent um, offenders. But many of the people who are locked up right now could be uh, working, and they have a mind to work. They just need uh, more guidance sometimes. They need more opportunity. So judges need to be aware of the alternatives that are that are there. You're right, the judge is not creating the job, mm -hmm. but the judge is often giving the individual an opportunity to go to work, 
show themselves productive, and show why they don't need to be locked up. I believe in the God of the Bible, the God who created the heavens and the earth, according to Genesis chapter 1. He created everything. And then Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. Um, he died on the cross, gave up his life for my sins, for the sins of the world. Uh, he was resurrected, and he returned to heaven. Many times, educated people, including myself, have a tendency to trust our own judgment and our own understanding. And God does give us a brain and a mind which hopefully works well, and hopefully we, we educate ourselves, hopefully we seek knowledge. But all of our rights and liberties come from, from him, the creator. Uh, in the Bible. So that's the God that I believe in. The laws of our land state that where the Ten Commandments have already been in the courthouse, uh, they oftentimes are considered uh, what's called an artifact or a piece of the history of the building. The United States Supreme Court uh, has made some rulings which suggest that attempts to place the Ten Commandments there when they have not been there before uh, many times it is considered to be a violation of the separation of, of church and state. Uh, I would not be in favor of trying to place the Ten Commandments in, in buildings just to place them there. I believe that we should have God's law in our heart. Um, you know, that's what I believe first and foremost. I'm certainly not for removing the Ten Commandments uh, when they're already there. I believe I agree with the United States Supreme Court. If they are already there, they are part of the building. You have the right to practice your religion uh, that you believe. Uh, mine, I believe in Jesus Christ. That's my religion. So I believe I have a right to pray wherever I may be. I don't believe that right can be taken away. Um, once, uh, one thing that happened to my, my son, who is now 17, when he was in the, um, I believe he was in the third grade, might have even been younger, but he was in a school in Cobb County, and he bowed his head at lunch over his meal. The lunchroom worker told him, we don't do that here and told him that we don't, we don't pray uh, in school. And my first inclination was to become angry, and then I realized she just didn't know the law. She actually thought that it was prohibited, and it is not. You absolutely have the right to pray over your meal. As a matter of fact, what a lot of people don't know is that children who are in school at recess or at other times, if it's not disrupting class, they have the right to hand out an invitation to a church event. Uh, the reason is if they have the right to hand out an invitation to a secular, what we call a secular or non-church event, then that same right applies. You cannot limit the right just because of religious content. Uh, so while we're not trying to force uh, religion on anyone, you do have the right to exercise uh, religion. A lot of people forget that. They, they concentrate more on uh, keeping the government from establishing a, an official religion, and they forget about the right of free exercise. If a school provides uh, after-hours um, classrooms or facilities for groups, they cannot prohibit uh, a group just because of uh, their religious beliefs. Um, so, you know, if, if you're going to allow someone to meet in a classroom for something not related to school, uh, if, a, if a group that you know, has uh, faith-based uh, beliefs, uh, wants to meet there, you've got to accommodate that. What's really more important, I think, is, is one thing of my platform is to raise awareness for the need for faith-based uh, life skills programs or faith-based rehabilitation programs. Studies have shown that where people rely on their faith, uh, they have a much better chance of recovery. They have a much lower chance of offending or reoffending, and I want to raise awareness for that. Judges cannot order someone into a faith-based program, but what a judge can do is recognize a faith-based program. If it is voluntarily chosen by someone, then the court has the power to approve that faith-based program just the same as a as a program not based on the individual's faith. And that is extremely important. Our courts, our courts have done that in Georgia and right here in Columbia County. We have uh, other judges who have approved uh, faith-based programs, and that's something I would like to, to do as well as chief magistrate. 
I've had uh, individuals come to me who actually are uh, believing in, in uh, pagan types of, uh, they're actually religions in my opinion, uh, but they're believing in things that, that are not what I believe, or they have rejected um, the things that I believe. And that's not a test. Uh, certainly it was not as an attorney. Um, I worked very hard to defend the rights of individuals regardless of their personal beliefs. Mm -hmm. And what that taught me and what I learned growing up and, and going to school, going through Duke University, going through University of Georgia Law School is to respect the rights of those who don't agree with me and to still treat them fairly and justly with respect that they are due. The magistrate court is based on the rule of law, which is one of the foundations of our constitutional republic in this nation, in this state, and in this county. And the rule of law says that it applies. We are a government of laws and not of men or, or people. And so the people are important, and we are the people. We make up this, this government, this country. But the law applies equally to everyone, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of their race or sex or national origin. Uh, you know, the law applies equally. So, no, it won't, uh, won't affect my judgment. My judgment will be based on law. It will be based on the rule of law. I believe the people should elect their judges, uh, especially with regard to magistrate judges. And that's a, a particularly good question when you're talking about the election for which I'm running in. Uh, magistrate judges actually run in what we call partisan elections. That is, we choose a party. Um, you know, many judges are elected uh, on a nonpartisan basis. That is, they don't run uh, on a particular party label or a party platform. Um, but with magistrate judges, because it is often called the people's court, I believe the people should elect their judges. And this is one of the reasons that I am running, is to give the people an opportunity to not only know who's running, to know that there are conservative Republicans running and that there is a choice. Jason Hasty stands for conservative Republican values. Even though the people may elect a judge, if you run as a Republican, you have to sign a pledge that you agree with the principles uh, of the Republican Party when you run. And so even though there's no political party that's perfect, obviously, uh, but I've been involved with the Republican Party for about 20 years now, and I have identified more closely with uh, the Republican Party than any other party. Uh, most of what the Republican Party stands for, I'm very, very strongly in agreement with. And so that's why I think that, that running as a Republican or running in a partisan race, it tells the public a lot about you by the party that you choose. Now, as you know, United States Supreme Court justices, and I am admitted to practice, I have not had a case there yet, but I am admitted before the United States Supreme Court. Um, but those justices are, of course, appointed by the president and then confirmed, uh, they have to be confirmed by the Senate. So that is a different process. We do not elect those judges. The founders of this nation and the writers of the Constitution believed that we should have a high court in this land that was not subject to uh, being elected. And that's how it was set up. And I agree with that. And magistrate court, first of all, uh, does not handle jury trials. In fact, the only trials uh, that are handled in, in magistrate court at all would uh, involve uh, ordinance violations such as disorderly conduct charges, underage possession of alcohol, uh, car wreck uh, or other damage cases where the value is less than $15,000, the damages are less than $15,000. It's often called small claims court the one exception to that $15,000 limit is dispossessory actions, landlord-tenant types of actions, where um, the damages could actually be more than $15,000. Um, death penalty cases would be handled in front of the superior court judges. That would not be an aspect of magistrate court. Abortion cases would not be an issue in, in magistrate court. The, the biggest issue um, and the, the biggest question that, that one might ask is, um, let's say a judge, for example, is personally um, what we call pro-life or pro-personhood type of judge. Uh, would that affect that judge's um, thinking or judgment if someone came before the judge, for example, who had had an abortion? Uh, if the judge knew that, would the judge 
hold that against that person. The thing to remember is that we all have certain biases and we all have certain beliefs. And I think it's better that we know who we're electing and we know about that person before we elect them at all. If you, if you disagree with a judge on personal issues and you disagree so much that you just can't stand for that person to be elected at all, then you have a right to know where that judge stands on those issues. But no, it would not affect my judgment any more than the color of one's skin, uh, where they, you know, where they come from, uh, whether they're Democrat, Republican, or Independent. Keep in mind, a lot of people call themselves a certain party, and really deep down inside, they don't really hold those beliefs uh, on the inside. And I think what's more important is character. What is their character? Uh, in my case. My trust in God, the fact that I've raised uh, two boys, one who's 17, one who's 12, I've been married for 22 years, those things tell you a lot about my character. And when I tell you that I will be fair and impartial and that I will follow the law, uh, I call upon those things as evidence that I will in fact do that. Uh, but we are all affected by our personal beliefs. Um, I mean, to say otherwise would be uh, disingenuous. We have a serious alcohol problem uh, in particular among our teens. Many times young people are getting the alcohol, you know, from the home or from a friend's home or from a so-called friend. Uh, we, we don't have a complete answer, but the life skills programs such as my church at Life Center on Bel Air Road here in Evans, Life Center Church has a life skills program that doesn't tell young people don't drink alcohol and that's it. But forces them to ask questions. What is the effect of alcohol having on me? What is it affecting uh, my finances or how is it affecting my finances? How is it affecting my family? What does the Word of God say about alcohol or drinking? And obeying the laws of the land. If you are under the age of 21, you're not supposed to be in possession of alcohol. You're not supposed to be consuming alcohol unless with certain limited restrictions or exceptions, such as your parents allow you to consume it in their home uh, with their permission, in their presence, or because of some religious ceremony, then certainly that's the law. If you allow your child to consume alcohol uh, purportedly for a religious purpose, you need to be responsible. Parents are not perfect. Uh, there have been cases, like you mentioned, where uh, um, young people have, have been killed or have died um, or otherwise been harmed because uh, of alcohol. You know, this nation tried prohibition uh, many, many years ago. Obviously, that didn't work out uh, so well. Um, we've done the best to have regulations. Uh, it's not a perfect world. That's why I said the faith-based programs, because they don't just tell people, look, don't do it, it's bad. The faith-based life skills programs try to educate our young people and our older people and our parents those types of programs try to make people look a little bit deeper than just do's and don'ts. And so that is why part of my platform is I want to increase awareness of the need for those types of programs. Uh, there's a lot of support in our churches, a lot of support. You can find people of, of like-minded faith, people who will stick with you, people who will pray with you, people who will meet with you. Um, you don't find a lot of that um, outside of the church. Uh, from time to time, you'll find it, but in the church is where it's more prevalent. I'm telling people to make a hasty decision because there will be two, hast two Jasons on the ballot. I'm saying vote for Jason Hasty. Prepare to make a hasty decision. Uh, but uh, And then there's also Chris Hudson, who is also running. Chris is a local attorney. Uh, the biggest difference between Chris Hudson and myself is the fact that um, I have devoted um, most of my career, 22 years of experience, um, I have devoted most of that to defending the Constitution. Chris has done a lot more civil types of cases. He's done a variety of cases. Um, I've practiced just about every type of law that the magistrate court handles and then, and then beyond. Uh, but the biggest difference between myself and Chris Hudson is that I have um, devoted so much of my career to defending the Constitution. Uh, defending the rights of those who don't have the money to pay me, including seven years as an assistant public defender. That experience has led me to an understanding that the cost of providing legal services where they are constitutionally required is a factor that we must consider. 
When I first started out with the uh, public defender's office, uh, we had 10 lawyers pretty much handling most of the felony cases. Uh, that number has grown to more than 20. It's more than doubled. The cost of the pensions and the retirements and the salaries is, is, is skyrocketing. So we have to take into account what are the ways that we can uh, be more efficient in providing those services which are required. Chief Magistrate uh, appoints um, the associate magistrates uh, and that appointment must be approved by the superior court judges. And while the practice that's going on there, uh, to be sure, while it is not strictly prohibited, um, I believe it should be. And it's a policy that I will implement there or the magistrate court. Also, I'll be spending more time uh, in the magistrate court. I'll be more like a full-time magistrate. We'll be able to have more court sessions. We also look forward, uh, we have talked to Sheriff Whittle about using the Appling Courthouse. Uh, as a resource largely unused. We can use that more to hopefully save some cost. Um, there are many different things that we can do. Many of those things are going to involve getting in there and working uh, you know, with the budget and trying to find ways to, to be more efficient.